Let's make a couple of changes to the simple transmitter which we demonstrated in the previous video. The first change I'd like to demonstrate is a change that prevents the battery from being discharged needlessly. So we're going to replace the battery with a capacitor. A capacitor is an energy storage element that's meant to be discharged quickly, and it doesn't store very much energy. And since we were only hearing pops in the radio, then we only need quick bursts of current in order to satisfy the demands for our simple transmitter. We don't need the current to flow after we hear that pop of power in the radio. So in the circuit that I've drawn here, we've got a capacitor C1, which will charge through resistor R from the big battery. If I imagine the moment that the battery is connected to the circuit as time t equals zero, I can plot the voltage across capacitor C1 as a function of time. Let's imagine that the battery voltage is V. The capacitor will charge exponentially and after some period of time, it will eventually reach the battery voltage. So I can control how long it takes capacitor C1 to charge by using a larger resistor or a larger capacitor. If you use a larger capacitor, it takes longer to charge. If you use a larger resistor, then it also takes longer to charge because it takes longer to push the current into capacitor C1. Now, where this capacitor circuit starts to really make a difference is when the switch is closed. So if I close the switch in the previous circuit, then all of the current that went through the switch was supplied directly by the battery. But in this circuit, all of the current when the switch is closed, or practically all of it, is supplied by the capacitor because any current supplied by the battery has to trickle through resistor R. There's not going to be very much of that. And anyway, I can control the size of resistor R so that the current from the battery is limited. So this is a very good modification we can make to the circuit. Of course, when the switch is closed, then the voltage across the capacitor is going to fall precipitously. And when the switch is opened again, then the capacitor can start to charge again. So as long as the capacitor is large enough to reach a reasonably high voltage in the period of time between when the switch is open and closed, then I'm okay. The second modification I would like to make to the circuit addresses the problem, at least in a small way, of wasting power by distributing it across the radio spectrum. Let's see if we can channel some of the radio energy into just one specific channel. So to do that, we need to somehow synthesize a sine wave. How are we going to do that? Well, one way to synthesize a sine wave is to use something called a tank circuit. In this particular circuit, the tank is given by inductor L and capacitor C2. When the switch is closed, capacitor C1 will now discharge, but instead of discharging directly to ground, it's going to charge capacitor C2. If I then later open the switch, then I isolate the tank circuit from the uh, battery and capacitor C1. So how does the tank synthesize a sine wave? To do that, I'm going to do a simple derivation. Once the tank is isolated from the rest of the circuit, we're left with a very simple circuit consisting only of capacitor C2 and inductor L. Now we have to start off by assuming that we already have some charge on capacitor C2 so that the voltage here is not just zero. The currents are going to be the same with a sign difference. So I could call this IL, I could call one of the currents IC. We also know that the voltages are equal to one another. I'm now going to substitute in for the relationships between current and voltage in a capacitor and an inductor. And since we know that these are equal, I'm going to substitute in for the inductor voltage now. I can pull out the constants L and C because these are just the size of the components. So we're left with a differential equation. I is the only variable in this equation. Now mathematicians have spent centuries trying to solve differential equations, and I don't have a good rule in order to say how I'm going to arrive at the solution I'm about to write down. But what I can say is that it's very easy to verify, at least, that the solution is correct. So one possible solution to the differential equation that I've just written is the following. We could write that the current is sinusoidal. I've written it as a cosine, you can write a sine, both solutions work. Let's take the derivative, and then let's differentiate again. Now let's substitute what we've just written from the solution back into the differential equation in order to verify that it's actually correct. So the current is cosine omega t, and the second derivative is minus omega squared times the cosine of omega t. The cosines cancel, and then I'm left with omega equals square root of one over LC. And this has to be true if my solution is correct. So what it means is that if I plot the current 
in this circuit with respect to time, it's going to be a cosine. And the frequency is omega, or 2 pi f. So the frequency of that sine wave can be controlled by choosing the appropriate inductor L and by choosing the appropriate capacitor C2. So by choosing these circuit elements, I can synthesize a sine wave at exactly the right frequency. So this should help improve the efficiency of my radio a little bit. And what happens in the actual circuit, of course, is that we're not going to get a sine wave that just carries on through all time. That would be something like a perpetual motion machine. In fact, what's going to happen in the real circuit is that we're going to get something that looks like a sine wave, but the sine wave is going to decay with respect to time as the power is radiated away through the antenna. So I've not really said too much about the antenna at this point, but the antenna in my circuit diagram somehow represents the fact that power is continuously lost. We're not just going to get a sine wave that doesn't decay because there's always some resistance in the circuit. And anytime you have electrons that are accelerating or anytime you have a current flow that is not constant with respect to time, you have to have radiative loss because of the Maxwell's equations. Anytime you have power loss through radiation, that power loss has to show up through a decay in the amplitude just by conservation of energy. So we don't have a pure sine wave, but it's certainly a lot better than in the previous example circuit or the previous transmitter where we didn't have any frequency selection at all. Now I'm going to show a demonstration of the circuit here that I've just drawn with a slight modification. Now the circuit is drawn here in the circuit diagram with just a switch. We need to open and close that switch periodically in order to recreate the high amplitude that we need at the beginning of the sine wave. So in order to open and close the switch very rapidly, I have a switch here in this little circuit board hooked up to a motor. So as the motor spins around, it opens and closes a switch really rapidly. I have a toggle switch here that allows me to power the circuit on and off. And I have another switch here that just controls the motor. So I'm going to turn the motor on. The other switch here turns the rest of the circuit on and off. I'm going to turn the radio on. And when I, when I hold down on the switch, we can hear something in the radio. The frequency that we're hearing from the radio is the switching frequency controlled by the motor. I can send Morse code now. Let's send an SOS message. I don't have very good range. We can send an SOS message maybe 10 centimeters. So if we have an emergency, uh, we'll be in good shape as long as the emergency is really close by. In the next video, I'm going to describe another improvement that we can make to the circuit that I just demonstrated. We're going to replace the motor with what's called a spark gap. A spark gap is a way to open and close a switch effectively without any moving parts. And the spark gap transmitter was a type of transmitter that was commonly in use in the early 20th century before the invention of the vacuum tube.